What's up, everybody? Once again, it's Brand Man Sean, and I'm back with another interview, a very special guest. I have Daniel D. Piazza. This guy is an entrepreneur, a true serial entrepreneur, not just there's a, you know, I have entrepreneur on a business card or my IG profile, just switched it over from a personal profile. Um, this man's been multiple businesses. He has a book, Rich 20 something, which shows you, hey, he got some money in his 20s and was able to talk about it, right? But right now, he's really heading the curve with a company by the name of Alpha Mentorship, where he's helping service providers, right? Uh, whether you're selling a course, whether you, you're you just a person who has, a, you're a, consul a consultant, sorry for fumbling that, but or you or you you have some side of type of business that you're offering to the public and you need some type of better leadership. Oh shit. My hold up. Thank God for editing. Yeah. Hold up. I just got this computer a couple of days ago. It's all good. I was I kept seeing something flash. All right. So, no rush. I'll back up. His primary company is Alpha Mentorship, where He's helping service providers. So when it comes to business, if you have a business where you're offering a course, if you have a business where you are a consultant and you're trying to figure out how to get more clients, think about digital marketing, right? You're, you're, you're in the digital space and you need somebody to help you with your leadership. You need coaching to become better and optimize your business as a whole, the entire infrastructure. He has a mentorship program to help you through and through, but that's not all we're talking about. This guy's doing some very interesting things when it comes to Superphone. Y'all have heard me talk about it before. What's up, Ryan? If you're out there, hopefully you see it. Lee, all y'all guys. He has an extremely interesting approach he's taking. He's going dark this year, getting off of social media. For, um, you know, I, and I'll let him talk a lot more about that. But Daniel, what's up, man? Appreciate having you. And like, let, let's talk, let, let's get into this going dark thing. I love this philosophy. I think I'm gonna follow you the whole year. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you that. So, but what, what's up, man? Let's start here. First, thanks for having you. Thank you, brand man. I appreciate it. Wow. Um, <laughs> no, uh, okay. I mean, look, the, the first thing is I'm not anti-social media. I'm not anti, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm just about having awareness of where in your marketing arsenal social media really exists, you know? Um, okay. Over the past, over the past, I don't know, it's 2020 now, I can't believe that. Over the past five years, um, social media has really, really exploded from, you know, something that we just connect with our friends on to something that has become, you know, a huge tool for businesses, you know, because you can, yep. you can target your exact user. Um, you, can, you can get in front of them all the time. The doors are never closed. Social media is always open. Um, but with that, I think we've really developed an over-reliance on that tool. And, you know, it's like the, the, the phrase, you know, when all you have is a hammer, you think everything is a nail. It's like everybody just wants to use social as the only tool, not realizing that the goal that this platform has for itself is different than the goal that you have for yourself and your business. Sometimes those interests are aligned. Sometimes you and Mark Zuckerberg are friends. Sometimes what you want also aligns with what he wants, but oftentimes they're at odds. So what does social media want? Now, when I say social, social media, I, I mean all, all platforms, you know, anything that's owned by Google. So YouTube, Google, fill in the blank, anything that's owned by Facebook, Instagram, um, you know, Facebook, the actual platform, I guess WhatsApp to a certain extent, you know, all these right. different platforms that are owned, TikTok. Um, their goal and their game is ad revenue from selling ad space. Okay, that's their main goal. In fact, anytime that there's a free platform, you're the product. Anytime that you get something <laughs> free, you're the product. You know, yep. when I joined Facebook in 2006, my dog is annoyed because I'm yelling, I'm screaming. When I, he's moving. When, when I joined Facebook in 2006, I thought, oh my God, Mark is so, Mark Zuckerberg is so generous. Thanks so much for giving us this platform. Wow, I can connect with my friends. This is dope, amazing. And then 10 years later, 12 years later, I realized, one, I'm trapped on this thing. I can't leave because I'm. it has tentacles in me real deep. And two, I'm being productized and commoditized because my attention is what is being sold to advertisers. And I am, I am the problem and the solution because I am also selling 
I'm also buying other people's attention with my ads. So we're in this little matrix now. And this matrix is making the platforms a lot of money. If you can figure out how to get ads to work for you, fine, that will make you money. But what you have to realize is that you don't own that data, okay? You, you guys saw um, Sean's interview with Ryan Leslie. He's talk, He's been beating this drum for years, and you know, it's it's pretty obvious. But you don't own the data. There is a third party. There's a net between between myself as a content creator, a producer, or an entrepreneur, and my audience and my customer. And that net are these third party platforms. You know, imagine if my phone only. Imagine if when I called you, only one out of every ten of my phone calls went through. That's what social media is because you put out a piece of content and no matter how big your audience is, only a small fraction of that audience really receives that message. And it's in competition with everybody else who's on that platform playing. You know, it's a very big sandbox and a lot of busy activity. So we, so our interests are not aligned with the platform's interests. We don't own the data, so we don't know who our customers are. You know, I went on one of my live streams the other day, which I had 20 people on there with an audience of 200,000 on IG. I'm not going to bitch about it. Okay, it is what it is. Uh, <laughs> but I had, I had an artist on there. Uh, it's a group called It's 99%. And they were saying the same thing. They say, we've sold over a million records, and we don't have a single email address of the people that we've sold to. But iTunes has Sheesh. it. And of course they do. You know, and this is, again, yeah. again, this is exactly what, what Ryan's been talking about, what Leslie's been talking about. So... Your interests aren't aligned with the platform's interest. You don't own the data, and your messages aren't getting through. You know, your all your messages aren't getting through. So those three problems combined um, makes it a real challenge to connect with your audience in a way that can give you the maximum results for all the work you're doing. And if you're an artist, if you're an entrepreneur, if you're a creator of any type, our whole life is creation. Our whole life is making something that we hope our audience enjoys. And if we put it out there and we don't know who we're connecting with and we don't have the bandwidth to hit everybody, then we're wasting a lot of our energy and time and that energy and time is money. So we got to take yes. that energy and time back by going dark. Well, what's dark? Dark social is anything that's not on the public face. Again, not a problem that public social media exists. I'm not deleting my accounts. I work way too hard to build those things and it costs me a lot of money to build them too. Okay, <laughs> but that's the top end of the funnel. So people find you through your public channels, but they're not going to buy with you in this at the same rate through the public channels as they will through the private channels. So what are the private channels? Text messaging and phone calls. That's what Superphone is being used for, and we can talk about how I'm using that in a second. I know I'm rambling, but like I'm having this just no, keep this. going. Okay, text messaging and phone calls, direct mail. Imagine if you were an artist and you started sending out direct like postcards to people. It just, <laughs> just it's so bizarre that it would stick because people just don't do it. And you can yeah. do it. It's not that expensive. I mean, it's gonna everything costs money. So don't, don't complain about how much money. Just figure it out. It's gonna cost yeah. money, but whatever. Um, direct postcards, direct mail, and email. And email still gets filtered to a certain extent, and there is a there is a bandwidth, uh, you know, restriction on everybody not doesn't open all your emails. But that's still a private channel. Those channels are the channels where you build intimacy. And intimacy is much more important than volume when it comes to, at the end of the day, engagement. And engagement is what sells. Mm -hmm. And that's why artists like Russ, who, well, I guess now he is, like, he is signed to a major. But, like, that's why artists like him can build up to the point where he can sh sell out a stadium, but he's also not Drake. You know, because that intimacy over time, mm -hmm. that connection with the audience, and that Kevin Kelly would say, you know, uh, former editor of Wire Magazine, a thousand true fans. That's how you build it. And you can take them from the public space to the private space and let them feel like they know you and really get to build that relationship with them. Then they'll do whatever you want. <sighs> okay. Deep, not wide. Deep, not wide. Deep, not wide. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I love the fact that you touched on, of course, that conflict of interest that happens with social media. I mean, it truly is. I always try to explain to people, understand the business model of these platforms. Yes, they will seem like the best place in the world at the beginning. It's the same curve. What I love about the business is the fact that there's patterns and it is so predictable, right? These platforms are going to welcome everybody with open arms and give all the incentive in the world for great content and really push for that. But once they hit a threshold where they have you stuck, they have those tentacles, <laughs> right? And you can't get away because there's this network effect, right? Once that exists, 
now they can start moving away from that and now things start to be hey let's make this money we know they're not going to leave is that is that bad relationship where you stay when you know you shouldn't at points right and and i love the fact that you're not just doing the the dark social thing but you're going all the way with it right because that's when you're going to find the best results and oftentimes just as somebody an entrepreneur myself and i mean true just as a person who's always self-improving and trying to work on habits i found that a lot of times if you try to add things on slowly it it just doesn't work right there, there's some things that you of course is it's more about let's be incremental and let's do compound effect but there's some things where if you don't just go all the way and just cut the cord you're not going to do it period or you're not going to find the the, yep. the results and somebody else going to come behind you and do way better yep. at it and you're you're going to be like fuck <laughs> yep. Yep. yeah yeah momentum 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 yeah. momentum is everything it's yep. or or a that, lot well, that, of it. so well, okay well, i was no, gonna say that's it. why on every piece of my content now i'm just putting the phone number and every piece, every piece, and every piece of, you, know, you can call me right now, plus one, because I'm in the US, 704 343 6659. Super phone will hit you back to put your info in there. And then after that, it's all me. It's actually me. You know, mm -hmm. I say that on all my content, just because even if you only pick up one person from each time you say that, if you're saying it a million times, the people will be there. You know? Yep. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's a, a good philosophy and understanding with marketing in general, right? Sometimes you just have to go for frequency and realizing that I can't expect the greatest gain. And particularly in an era when we have this content that we can create for less, right? You're not spending much, well, you know, whatever you, the way your production value is, but outside of that, just to get it distributed, you're not really spending that much extra money. So not worrying about the greatest ROI for one piece of content and getting caught in that paralysis. And I'm speaking to artists especially because I know that so many of you, um, you guys or people just who haven't taken that that jump. I have friends who want to start a YouTube page, but they still have this anxiety about their first video and it's been two, three years now, right? Just getting out there and doing it again and again, there's going to be this this exponential effect over time, but you don't allow for the cumulization because that, that's where the game is won, honestly, but you never can get to the win if you just don't start and put it out there, but it's all ego. We say it's fear and, or like, we use all these other words, but really look, you're insecure and I, we, I get it. Everybody has that. So when we talk about social and the fact that you're going to be going dark, one, I want to say, what got you to the standpoint of that comment where you say you can just post and you might just add something and don't worry about it? What got you there mentally? And then after that, what got you to the idea where you say you're going to go all the way in terms of being dark? Uh, so, I mean, so you're saying the first part is like what got me to the point where I was comfortable enough just to even be on social and be publicly producing? Or have that mindset even like when you apply to the number, right? I'm just going to put it on everything because some people might oh, say, yeah. um, maybe I'm only going to put my number on it when it makes sense. I don't want to act like they get into right. that mind. They think of different, um, a lot of different things. I mean, it's just time in the game and understanding like how it works. You know, I think that we really underestimate, this is Bill Gates. We, we underestimate what we can do in one year. We, we overestimate what we can do in one year, but underestimate what we can do in five. Like, yes. I don't, I don't know what effect me have me saying my number every time if you do a piece of content is going to have in 90 days. Hopefully it will do well. But in five years, it I, I'm, I'm certain it will crush. I'm certain, you know? Mm. And um, I've just been through enough cycles at this point of where I've been through business ups and downs. I've built an audience to this point. I know, I know that it, it's a lot of smoke and mirrors with like, you can have a big audience and it doesn't produce revenue and you can have a small audience or you can not even be on social and be killing it. So mm -hmm. there's no correlation between the numbers necessarily, like the number of subscribers you have, the number of followers you have and how much revenue you can make to a point, you know, obviously it would be great if I have 3 million followers, but I don't need 3 million followers to make $3 million. Um, so the frequency factor is just really important because one, you get comfortable with it. Two, you realize that like, you never know what piece of content is going to hit somebody, you know? 
So you never know which piece of content is going to get shown to who and what's really going to resonate with them. So you might as well, you know, you might as well give everyone the opportunity every time they connect with you to get, you know, to, to have, to, to start that, you know, that value chain, to start moving down that funnel. And, and it, these things are memorable. I mean, shit, Mike Jones, 281-330-8004. I haven't listened to that song in forever, you know, yeah. the original social handle. And yeah. um, that stuff sticks. And so, you know, there's just, no, there's no downside to it. And it's all, upside. there's no downside. It's all upside. It's all cumulative. This whole game is cumulative. There's no exponential success. I think we've been brainwashed by like stories of like people making it in X amount of time or like billion dollar valuations of companies that grew unicorns overnight. Like we've been brainwashed with thinking that things should happen with these like these meteoric rises, but that's really not mm. the reality of what most of product building, company building, audience building is. So just get that out of your head and be comfortable with, with the mundane part of it, which is just like, okay, today I'm making this content and I'm putting my phone number on it. And there will be a point that's an inflection point where all the stuff you've done will, if you're doing the right, co- the right, the right content to the right audience over time, that compound interest will create inflection points where it will seem like overnight something happened and it spikes. Like, you know, like for instance, mm-hmm. putting your content on all your shit and then, you know, uh, you get coverage from a big media source and then people start looking at all your content and now all your content has your phone number on it. So it explodes because yep. every piece has it on there. But yep. you can only have that from seeing it. It's like bamboo grows underground for eight to 10 years and then on year 10, it explodes and can go 20 feet overnight but there was still growth happening underground. You know, it wasn't like zero growth and then everything. There's processes happening. And that process for you is the consistency of the day after day. And then allowing that, allowing yourself to get smarter so that you can be more effective. And that's when you'll explode. Interesting. I love that you say that because I tell people now because of consumer behavior has shifted to binging essentially. Right. Mm-hmm. And you mm-hmm. want to make sure you have everything there, that catalog of information or whatever that is there. Once people have, have you have people's attention, you need to make sure you have everything in place to maximize that attention. And in totally. the same way, we've condensed the fan funnel where I can hear an artist song and now I might look them up and say, oh, snap, this artist has been releasing stuff or they have a whole project for a minute and I become there. I just listen to all their stuff. The same thing with the TV show, the same thing if you're a marketer with the funnels that you create, but I'm working on fun- some funnels right now, just got out of a meeting where, all right, I know I'm creating this content, this content, this content, this content, not expecting anything from it in the next three months, but I know a lot of the other things that happen when, the, when everything starts to pop, all these funnels will go and then literally all the ties will rise. It just takes that one piece of thing and I think we hear that so much with artists but just in general it's like the catalog whatever you're doing currently just consider your catalog it's also why I think things like Snapchat have uh have struggled because the incentive that isn't there in terms of you you haven't been able innately how it was designed right to create that catalog where now you get that effect it's kind of antithetical to just business and brand right it's, it's every you have to create um, every single time and, and, and maintain, but um, shifting to you with the social, what is, you explain what going dark is like those platforms, the email, the text, the direct mail, which is just crazy, the direct mail. Um, but what is your plan to implement it? And I would love, yeah, especially if you can walk through some of those examples of you showing it earlier. So people can kind of All get right. an idea of what that looks like practically. You All know right. I mean? I'll walk through it <laughs> one more time. <laughs> playing with you. Okay. So first of all, like, again, you just want to use, it's all leverage, right? So it's like, you want to okay. use the weight of these big giants, to their advantage. So you can use public platforms to build your private, your private platform. Um, mm-hmm. So one of the things I've been testing, so, so, so Superphone, if you guys don't know, I'm not getting paid for this, but superphone.io is where you can go. There's there's more than uh, one texting platform. There's one called Community Now, um, which I haven't tried, but there are some things I'm unsure of about it that I don't necessarily like as much as Superphone. Um, but can you touch on that really quickly? 
Yeah, yeah. Um, one, I'm a Ryan Leslie stand, but that's beside the point. Uh, two, um, <laughs> community, like one thing that I've noticed is that um, they are focusing really heavily on big influencers, grabbing big influencers to promote the brand. And I think that um, it's watering down the message because everyone knows that Diddy's not really texting with you. Yeah. And Superphone is designed, its position is one is a, one of like a one-on-one -on -one connection. And the way to position it is, this is my actual phone. So I think mm -hmm. it's more helpful to people who aren't mega celebrities. Two, there's a tech issue, which I realized, which Superphone, when you get into the systems and you start sending out messages, you realize that they make you put a personalized F name tag in all the messages, meaning you have to have like, hey, Sean, this is Daniel. Here's today's message or whatever. You have to put a tag in there. And I asked them why they did that because there are sometimes when I want to send messages where I don't want to have the first name in there. Um, and they said that one thing they found was that um, if you take out the first name and you only have the text and it's not personalized, that means that when you send out a blast, every text is the same and a lot of carriers block that as spam. Um, because you know if you have 10,000 phone numbers, and you send out 10,000 of the same, hey, what's up, concert tonight, blah, blah, blah. A lot of text carriers see that as 10,000 of the same message. They're going to block that because that's spam. And I just, that was just one example of I've seen a lot of the, the thought that Superphone's put into some of their features and like how they do things. I'm like, you guys aren't just making a product to make a product. You actually put a lot of thought into the user experience around this. And I appreciate that, you know? Gotcha. Makes and they're, they're, they're a solid team. Um, but in terms of like, examples so the first thing is uh, and I'm, I'm testing all this stuff so I'll, I'll, i'm i'm in the testing phases uh you know take what you want and see how it works for you the first thing i'm doing and i'll share my screen with you here um is i'm running ads to my phone number which is like kind of again it's a little bit like antithetical because you're like wait a minute you're using the platform that you're bashing to get people to the private platform again i'm not bashing it i just want to know how i can utilize it to my best advantage so here's an example of an ad i'm screen sharing on this this is an ad that i'm running uh i'm tired of social let's have a real conversation text me on myself as advice Zad advice is my little is my little slogan like it's like i'm zaddy and then it's advice and it's advice and uh <laughs> there's my number you know and there's a, it's subtle branding because it's like my little hashtag there and then I'm wearing my shirt and it's kind of distorted. So it's a little bit of attention grabbing. It makes me look very light though. I'm a little bit darker than that in real life. And then, uh, <laughs> and then there's my number. And so I'm testing this now and I'm running this only to my warm audience of people who are on my email list and people who are on, who are engaging with my social platform. So it's just, it's a kind of a closed circle because what I'm doing here is I'm not trying to bring awareness of me. I'm just trying to convert existing fans who are already in my orbit. Because I figure, like, if you don't know me, why would you text me? So you don't need to know. You, you, this doesn't need to go any wider because it's an existing audience. So this is one thing that I'm using, which, uh, you know, I'll see the results in this. We'll, we'll see as it goes, like, what the results are in this. Um, another thing I'm doing is, uh, is I, like, it's in my bedroom now, but I have hoodies and, and sweatshirts that are printed out just for my own personal use. Well, when I do talks now, it's just a giant phone number, you know, and it's like text for his advice. It's just my giant phone number. So now when I get on video of me doing talks or I'm in public for talks, it's just very, I know it's a little corny, you know, but like, I don't care. Um, hey, like it works. Does it yeah, work? <laughs> like, like, even, like even a few years ago, the baby was going around in a diaper. So true. what do I care? You know, true. <laughs> you know, so I'm going around with my phone number. Um, and obviously I'm putting my phone number on every single piece of content. I actually might even change the main headline of my website to just be my phone number. So I'm just like being as obvious and almost obnoxious as I can with that just because people who already like me will do it and people who don't care, don't care. So it doesn't matter. Um, so that, and then if you want, I can walk you through how I use this in a real use case. Yeah, do it. Do okay. It. I think it's gonna be super useful. Super useful. So imagine you are, you know, I mean, you can be an artist or you can be, um, you can be a consultant or a coach or an entrepreneur who's doing service-based stuff. I mean, this is widely applicable. Like you can, you can think about this and don't think about my specific use case, think about how you could use it. But, um, I have a, I have a, an existing text message list. So just some background on how I got that. Um, I've been, I've been in this game for, you know, many years now and I was like smart and or fortunate enough to like have enough foresight to say, maybe this data will be useful one day. So I've been collecting phone numbers for mm. years, even though, so like I, I already had the seeds of a Sith Lord. I was going dark early. <laughs> uh, I knew that I was going to need this info. 
but I've never really used it. You know, so I've been collecting phone numbers since 2000, honestly, 2014. Um, so that'll give you some context to how long this takes. Um, and I've been collecting them because I was doing, when I was doing webinars every week, I would use text messages for reminders, um, just like one-off reminders. I, um, for a while I had, there was another service called call loop, which I don't use anymore and I wouldn't recommend, but I was using them for text messaging. This is like maybe five years ago. So like I knew there was potential there, but I didn't, I wasn't fully on board, but I do have the numbers deep in my database. And like, okay. again, it just shows you how useful data is. Like it's all about the data, you know, yep. a quick little aside here. Uh, when, when Dollar Shave Club sold to Gillette for a billion dollars, they weren't selling the razors. They were selling the customer list. Okay. Because mm -hmm. Gillette did the math and they said it will cost us more than a billion to get all these customers who are on subscription <laughs> recurring revenue. We might as well pay you guys a bill and we'll just take the customer list. They're paying for data. You know, everything is data. When you sell a company, you're selling the data of that company, especially if it's a recurring business. So anyway, data is very useful. So I had this data um, from years of like writing blog posts online and doing social media content and running ads. So that's when I say I spent a lot of time and money to collect this stuff. And you will too, because this is a long-term play for you artist out there, you entrepreneur or whatever. This is a long-term play. So I have about 12,000 phone numbers, 11 and a half thousand. And um, I, you know, I brought him back from the dead recently. In fact, I only started texting these people the week of Christmas, you know, just to see if it would work. I'm just like, let me import this okay. stuff and see if it works. And I sent out my first like happy holidays text. And people, a lot of people were like, yo, fuck you. Like unsubscribe, you know, get me off of this really? thing. A lot. Well, I mean, you know, from a list of 12,000, you know, even if it's like 200 people, that's a small percentage, but it's a lot of fuck yous. Um, <laughs> you know. But check this out. On a list of 12,000, I only got one dick pic, which I thought was amazing, you know, in terms of ratio, ratio. Like, you think it would be more, right? I mean, one dick <laughs> six sick people. So, but, but then what I learned was some of these people, but here's my assumption. My guess was that this data was, okay, people don't change their phone numbers nearly as often as they change their other things. Um, I still have my phone number from when I was in high school. So I knew a lot of these numbers would still be good. And, um, and although I did get some people who were like, fuck you, take me off this list. I got a ton of people who were like, oh my God, Daniel, I can't believe you're texting me. This is amazing. Wow, I've been following your work for how many years? Because da, 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 da. my yeah. assumption was, if you've been following my social and my email list and you still like my stuff, if you got a text from me, you wouldn't mind it. Like, that would be okay. You know, yeah. if I got a text from my favorite author, who's a New York Times bestselling author who you watch and been following him and all this bullshit, you'd be like, that's pretty cool. And then if he actually yeah. texts you back, your mind would be blown. You know? Yeah. So I did it. And it worked. And so like, okay, this is going to work. So the next, like, you know, in a week and a half later, like once the holidays hit, no, no, this was like, this was, this was like, this was like December, like the last week of December, I just said, I'm going to test this out. And I sent out a text to 11,000 people. And I'm like, Hey, I'm, I'm thinking of doing a live meetup in LA um, on, you know, on January 4th, which is just last weekend as of this recording. So I gave them less than a week to decide. And usually people like when I, I've done a lot of live events and usually people need like some, some lead time just to like get their schedules. And I just want to see what would happen. Mm -hmm. So I sent out this, this text and from the 11,000 people, I got a hundred people to say, yes, I'm interested in learning more about that. Now the conversion rate on that isn't like super high, but at the same time, it was the first time I've ever done this. They're still learning that I'm texting them. Like there's some warming up to do. Right. I was a hundred people is still a lot. And I know this because like, I have a, a 44,000 person email list and it would be harder to get 11 or it would be harder to get a hundred responses of a yes from the email list probably than it would be from the text. Just cause I know open rates. I know like just, or even on social media, like I have over 200,000 just on Instagram and I could do that shout on Instagram and I wouldn't get a hundred responses that say yes, probably just because of exactly you just don't, it just doesn't work as much as you think it does. I can put it up on a story and I can have, a thousand people see that and I'm not going to get a hundred responses. So like to get that from my text message list, I was like, it's pretty solid. And, and a lot of people probably didn't respond just because they weren't in LA. So why would they respond to that? I was going to ask you, did you target based on location at all? Well, the thing is because this is old data, like when you, when you get people in super for the first time, it makes them put their location down. But mm -hmm. if you, if I'm just importing data, all I have is their name, their phone number and their email address. So I don't have all that data and I'm still enriching the data. You know, I'm still enriching it. So I don't even have great targeting right now. I'm still getting there. But so this is a, a black. Be clear. What does enriching the data mean? 
Oh, well, you're a tech guy. Um, you know, it's like enriching the data is like um, adding additional information, adding additional fields of info to the data you already have um, and getting more complete data. You know, so if you only have an email, a phone number and a name, I want to get your location, your birth date and your sex and all that stuff so that I can geotag you. Um, and, and so what's been happening is when people text me back and I realize that I don't have all the information, I'll say, I have a little hot key on Superphone that says, Hey, I got your, uh, info from my old email list. Thanks so much. You know, would you mind filling this out so I can keep in touch? So I have your complete info and then they fill that out and I get their enriched data where I get like their location. And then that way, when I come to their city, I can say how many people are in New York and I can do my New York tag. Um, but I didn't have this when I was making that meeting and that's going to take me all year to get that info. Like I'm not just, it's going to take me all year to get that info and I'm committed to that. But so I got a hundred responses, you know, give or take. And, uh, and then of that, I said, I emailed, I texted them back and I said, great, here are the, here's the info. And I sent them a little form and it was $50. Um, and I got, it was $50 for the meetup. It was less than a week and I got 30 people to sign up. And I actually honestly missed some people who were interested. So I probably could add more if I would, it's just, it was a lot to filter through, but I got 30 people to sign up. It was 50 bucks. So it was 1500 bucks on the front end. Not bad. Just I from mean, text message. From text message, you know, not bad on the front end. But keep in mind, I have bigger channels than this. I, on the top end, I have social media, which is like well over, I don't know, three or 400K combined. And then I have an email list, which is like tens of thousands of people. This is my smallest channel with one text message. So think about the levels of magnitude there. So, yeah. you know, purchases on the front end, uh, 1500, 1500 bucks. Um, so there's a small amount of profit there cause I pay for the space. So anyway, I get 30 people into the room. This was last weekend. You can go on my YouTube channel. You can see the recap of this event. And, um, basically what I did was I did a three hour meet and greet seminar and a Q and a it should have been five hours, it should have been longer, honestly. Um, but it was three hours. And, uh, then what I did was I sent out a feedback survey. I'm going to show you guys this feedback survey because it's so just slick daddy. I mean, if you're a marketer, you know, it's just, <laughs> Slick daddy. And I, I was trying to tell my wife about this. She's like, I just don't care. Um, I mean, she cares, but you know, it's like not as exciting for her. It's, just, it's a different kind of care. It's a different kind of care, <laughs> you know? So here's the, uh, here's the type form. Cause I was thinking like, whenever you have a funnel, you want to be able to follow up with people uh, mm -hmm. or whatever you have, whenever you're making a sale on the front end, I've learned this from a lot of events. You want to be able to have something to offer on the back end, Cause I mean, it's just how business is. It's just how it should run. Like you should have an offer. Otherwise it's like you're just wasting all that attention in the room. Like you just, you know, it's like they're in there in person. If they're there, they're close fans who like you. Why wouldn't you have something for them? You know? So what I did was um, I sent in this feedback survey. The feedback survey is very non-invasive because it does two things. One, it gets their feedback, which they want to give their feedback and it gives them a chance to give me, ideas for making the next events better um, and two it allows me to slip in a sale without sending them to a sales page because people are automatically like sales pages I mean they're fine they work but if, if they know they're going to a sales page they categorize it as this is a sales page I'm looking at and there's a bit of a barrier there mm -hmm. so what I did was as you're seeing on the screen I have a survey um, it says hey thanks so much for attending uh, it was an honor to meet you here it takes a moment for the feedback so I go through their full name and their information by the way, I already have all this info. The reason I asked for it again is just because, you know, from, from doing this for many years, I know sometimes you don't have complete information and you want to be able to, like, let's say I need to export this list. I, I just want to have all the info. I don't want to have to go yep. cross-reference my database or be like, yeah, you know, I just, I've just done it too many times. I'm just like, give me your info again. You know, <laughs> um, I just, you know, I'm tired, man. Okay. Yeah. Cause now you can say, I want to, well, what if I would just want to do something specifically with the people who gave me feedback right. and right. You know, these are these people. I have all the info, but do I want to go through super phone and convert kit again? No, I don't know. Nope. Um, yeah. So how would you rate the overall experience on a scale of one to 10? By the way, I'm starting off with low investment questions just to get them to start answering the survey. That's some psychology there. They're easy to answer. Um, you know, what would you, uh, how much would you, how likely would you be to come back to another event? Low investment. Um, now this is kind of like, I mean, it's a medium investment. What was your number one takeaway inside or breakthrough moment from the event? Um, how can we improve the event next time? Uh, what questions do you still have that you did not get to ask the, at the event? So these are at, allowing me to like tweak the events that I do in the future to just make them better, um, tweak the messaging. 
And then here's the cool thing. So I'm considering doing some mini coaching packages with 10 people from the event. So what does that first of all say? Considering, meaning it's not really a sale. I'm just thinking about doing this. Are you interested? Two, 10, there's a little bit of scarcity around that. So it's like, oh, there's only 10. And then I thought about like having a whole sales phase and shit. And I have all the copy I can give, but I don't, I just didn't want to do a sales page. I'm just like, I want to do it, you know? So I just put this the offer here. You're going to get an hour of my time to go deep on your challenges and we'll develop a strategic plan for your business. I'll also give you access to my entire profit paradigm business curriculum, which is just my, the, the digital component of my coaching program. Um, and I'll check up on you to make sure you stay on track. By the way, that checkup is going to be an automated checkup from Superphone, which they can hit me back on. So investment is 350. Would you like one of the 10 spots? Um, and so they can click no, and they'll just be taken to a page that says, you know, they'll submit it and they'll say, thanks, have a nice day. Thank you for your feedback. But if they click yes, it takes them right here to a payment page. They put in their info. Um, then it's hip hooked up with Zapier. Zapier hooks it up to, um, to Gmail. Gmail shoots them out a, a message that says, thanks, here's where you can book. That's hooked up to my Calendly and they schedule on the call. So what happens is all I do is send them out a feedback survey. They go through this thing. I get feedback and sales with no additional effort. And I, I opened up my phone the next day and I already saw bookings on my calendar and money on my Stripe. I was like, excellent. This is great. <laughs> you know, and all this was, and, and I didn't make any public offers. This is all internal. So the only people who bought are the people who chose to go down that, that lane with me, you know, and, and that was if I wanna, how many text messages at this point? Uh, I mean, you know, to my whole list, it was, I did one text message to my whole list. One to your whole list. One to my All whole right. list. I did, um, and then I did one follow up to the hundred. Oh no, I did two follow ups to the hundred. Okay. Okay. And then one follow up with the survey. So four text messages. Four text messages. Um, and this generated. We got from the first send of this, we got five bookings, which five times 350 is, you know, like uh, 1750, I think, something like that. Um, so that's on top of the 1500 we already made. So that's three plus grand. And then I'll, I'll, I'll send this out again because it's all I'm doing is saying, can I get your feedback? Which is much less aggressive than saying, can I get you to buy? Mm -hmm. So I'll send this out again and say, hey, I didn't get your feedback. You gotta, but really what I'm doing is I make sure they see the offer. Um, and so my goal with these is to low key, like I can get just 30 people to the event each time, which I know will get better and better as I do more of these. But if I can get just 30 people and make five grand off each event, I'll do two of those a month. And I'll make an extra 10 grand. That's an extra 120 K a year from just like, from like, no, there's like no, no imprint of that. Like no one sees it on social. I'm not emailing it out. It's just a couple text messages and it adds extra 120 K to my bottom line. And all I'm doing is like simple automations and a little bit of texting. Love it. Love it. Like you know? I said, no imprint on the social, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine, but that's how things used to go down anyway. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, exactly. That's, that's how, and, and that just goes to show you now, now I could go on social and I could try to, you know, fill these spots with, you know, and I've done that for years. I've done that and I could do, I could do it that way. Um, but it just, it doesn't work as well for me because I like to be targeted now. What was and the like open rate? When you sent it to that site, list. And that's what this dark social allows. Uh, the open rate on what? So you sent that one text, right? What was the open rate on that one message? That first well, message to the to everybody? It's hard to say because they don't have statistics on open rates. But I mean, presumably, you know, text message open rates are very high. You know, if okay. it's a good list, it's going to be as high as 98%. Who knows? You know, but I can tell you, I can tell you on other things like, um, I, I, well, I guess if it's a sign up, I can tell you that I've had um, like, I'll have as high as like uh, on a whole list send a 5% click through rate, which doesn't sound like a lot, but like if I send a text message out to 11,000 people and I get 700 to 900 clicks, that's a lot. Exactly. Like, I, it might not sound like a lot, but it's a lot. Cause I know mm -hmm. email stats and they're not like that. Yep. You know, um, I mean, if you know the influencer game, if you talk about Instagram stories, oh, people are so, you know, hyped up about swipe ups, bro. I've been on that game. The, the swipe up click through rate is low, dude. It's so low, you know, because people are just, it's being fed to them and they don't, they don't, they're not programmed to do that. 
But click, click through rates on text are really, really good. On my targeted stuff, where I'm only sending out to 100 people, I would get like 90% click through rate. And again, it's all about targeting. So it's like, can you get fine enough where only the right people get the right message? And if you can figure that out, that's, for me, that's going to be an extra. I mean, if I can tweak this, this would be an extra 120 to a quarter million dollars a year just for me, like doing these little 30 person events around the country. <laughs> you know, like. Love it. Why couldn't you do this with music? Why Damn. couldn't you offer them a, a VIP package? Why couldn't you offer them a meet and greet? Why couldn't you offer them, you know, um, shit. I mean, some people would do collabs. Like, I mean, there's so much stuff you could, this funnel could be endless. It's so many different directions. And there's, so there's um, one artist that I'm not, you know what, I'm not gonna put this out there because I might want to work on that and <laughs> pitch it to him and do, do the work for him. But there's definitely some, um, a lot of artists that have the opportunity, if you don't want to be out there in the normal way, to still monetize. And I think we're going to shift it in into a, in a, a point where we see a lot of artists become strictly recording artists, especially as social media has heightened things like social anxiety and created difficulty around it. And then touring isn't the life that everybody really is about anyway. You're going to see more and more people figure out how to monetize through content and experiences that are in person that are either more intimate, right? Like social media greets and things like you said, or, um, are in person from a standpoint of I might be a, do a live digital concert I might, or I might do a live this, right, with, with a few people and play some stuff in the room and all those types of things. You know, to be honest, if there, like, there's plenty of um, like those live porn sites, right? That's, that's essentially what it is, right? Live These Jasmine. People, like exactly. Right. <laughs> people are paying uh, like for that personal experience and you can interact. Uh, artists could do that. You could do that. I could do it. Why not? Anybody can do that. It's it, that which actually weirdly reminds me. I read somewhere and now it, it's kind of clicking so, that apparently the porn industry has been at the head at, at um, of most of our technological revolutions. Now virtual reality is being. I model. believe it. So I believe it. Which is which is a really interesting thing. But it, it's, it's there. And when I asked you the numbers, I was thinking, so if you got 700, 6 to 700 clicks from that text blast, which knowing numbers, that means you probably, you definitely had in the thousands of opens, right? Oh, certainly. You know, plenty Easy. of opens, because click-through rates, I mean, yeah, that's Whoa. that's going to be 3%, 5%. So you definitely had, what, 9,000 opens, 10,000, I don't know. I mean, my, my click-through, like to give you an example, on my email list, you know, hey, you can say whatever you want about my email, maybe my engagement could be better, I don't know. But I know that pre, on industry standard for my, for what my industry, you know, Open rates are 10 to 20 and 20 would be high. 20 would be high for, for my, but that's open. Click through rate, Sean, I'm not kidding you, is 0 0.02 on a good day. Click through rate. Yeah. Now maybe I'm just shit and I'm not good, yeah. but I'm just telling y'all that's what I'm used to seeing on <clears> email. And I have a much bigger list than I do text. You know? See, and what I like to make this stuff comparable for even so even when i try to position that there's still some value in emails well let's comp or compare it to social media and the fact that instagram is throttling you know the the, the attention right so, so if we're looking let me if you don't mind i'm gonna pull up your instagram page i'm embarrassed go scroll down i have better engagement on the on older ones <laughs> but people don't realize it's happening to everybody though I know. and which I try to position and tell artists because it's like, if you're going to be paying for influencers, like if anybody, everybody is being throttled. So that means when that the graphic post so, sick, why would you talk about this one? That's you so you cool. like, you, you like the hazy shit, huh? I do. I do. <laughs> Wait, is this you? That's me. Yeah. This you look here. different from that angle. You look different from that angle. I know. I'm sorry. All right. you know. So look, check this out. This post 344, 18, a thousand one hundred eighty-one, just seen by a thousand people. You have two hundred twenty-three thousand followers. You yeah. sent out a text and got more people to actually open that and Correct. then click through that. Correct. Right? That's the that's what we're up against because again, right we're at a point like you said at the beginning of this talk, where the, that conflict of interest is arising again with social media. Like we know. As a matter of fact, if you switch to a business profile and they see you start adding, running ads, 
a lot of people have noted and you know you could call it paranoia but you could but i feel like a lot of the proof has been in the pudding over the last years when they see you running ads they'll these you know decentivize your page even individually because they want you to keep running ads they say oh this is the right it's almost like they qualified you at that point right yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. um I don't blame, so I don't blame them. like it's a smart business idea for them it just sucks for me exactly and you can't be mad at it. there is no hating to do at the end of the day you were able to leverage this platform but to your point you don't own this platform so look at it as an opportunity a platform to borrow but understand that you're borrowing and bring it back to something that you own right that's yep. simple yeah boom that's exactly I, it i appreciate the the live you know case study that you're providing because this guy drops quality content and he showed by the fact that he was able to do that from a text right that is not oh he just has like scammed and he, his profile is invalid people don't value him is just the fact that he's in a place where eyes are against him and most people are in that place right thank so, you brand man <laughs> <laughs> i feel validated now <laughs> It, it, it's this the reality. I feel like the better people can look at it and understand the macro game that's at play, the better you can understand how to act in your micro game versus judging and looking at it person to person. It's like, no, who's who really is behind all of this, right? Who is the, the curtains? We, we like to be have conspiracy theories. Well, it, it directly applies. It's not even a conspiracy theory. This is just how the company runs. And it's not a good or bad thing. It's just about how you how you're going to leverage it. So I'm I'm curious, man, um, based on like some of the things you've seen, right? You, you talked about the event that you, you know, you're probably going to scale up. Are the, do you have any interesting ideas that you would like to leverage the whole dark social um, experiment with that you can talk about at this point? Yeah, I mean, one of the things that I'm really excited about, uh, one of the things I've realized over the past couple of years is that like I am... Uh, an entrepreneur through and through, but I'm also a creative and I really love doing out, out of the box, um, like marketing that really, that, that forces me to leverage my creativity, which is actually why I resonate with your content so much, because, you know, you're like on the front end of it, you're talking about music, uh, like the music marketing and the music industry, but really it's just creative product launches. It's like, it's the same, <laughs> you know, and you, you come from a tech background and so you have you can play both sides, you know, both worlds, but like, it's really just creative product launching. Um, but one of the things I want to start focusing on is doing physical mail, which like nobody in my space is doing. Nobody's doing physical mail. Um, so I'll show you this, this, uh, this site, because most people probably don't know about this. Um, let me go here. Let's see here. Uh, share my screen. So this is Postable and Postable sends really, really nice cards like postcards and newsletters and like, like really well, well done, high quality stuff. It's very cost effective. And just like with your um, super phone or any of the other data you have, it, I mean, this is a data play here. So I'll log into my account here and, um, and What's so cool about this is that I have automated birthday cards that send out to all my like really close friends. And I forget about these. Like I, I genuinely forget about these. And they, my friends text me all the time. They're like, oh my God, thank you so much for that card. Um, because one, like it really, I mean, it truly, truly looks handwritten. Um, and it like the sentiment is from the heart, but it's just like, I mean, you know, it, okay, these are my close friends. Um, this, is the, this is the birthday card I've been sending out. I got to switch this up so they don't get the same one two years in a row. But it's um, <laughs> a new year terrain ahead. And then it says on it, um, it says on it, what does it say? Uh, let me flip it over. Oh, let me go back. Let's see what it says. Uh, I'll try to figure out how to look to see what it actually sends. Um, so what it actually says, but um, let's see if I can go here. Oh, this is actually pretty cool. I haven't been on the site in a while. I mean, it's so automated. I don't even go on this sometimes. Let me see. Uh, who do I have in the queue? So I have, 
so I have, so here I have people who are in the queue. So I have like my friend Dane, his birthday was on Christmas. Amy's was sent. Matt is in the UK and I know he got his. I have a few coming up who I know are going to their house. Um, and what this does is it allows me to get automated touch points with my friends from a really hand, from, from a, like, a, like, a, like an actual, like a genuine perspective, because it is my intent to give them this touch point and allows me to do it at scale. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to see if I can show you my address book. This is pretty cool. This is similar to Superphone. Um, there's a link that you can get for Postable here where you can pass this out. And let's see. This is my Postable link. Nice so, background, man. Which one is that? Oh, is it Iron Man? Yeah. Yeah. You know, just got to stay inspired. Um, so this is my postable link. It's very similar to what would happen on Superphone. So what I'm going to start doing is bringing people on into like there's concentric circles, right? So like social media is my biggest audience and then email and then text message. And the people who want to get on the deep inside are going to be on my personal mailing list. And so I'm going to probably quarter three of this year, I'm going to start where I'm like, Hey, I'm working on this new newsletter where only my best people are going to be getting this. And I'm going to send I'm going to send them this form, which is my postable. And then I'm going to be able to get their like even more information again, enriching this data. Cause like for instance, Superphone has their uh, birthday, but it won't have their, it won't have their mailing address. So it's like mm -hmm. even more data. Um, and I don't necessarily need to ask them for their mailing address until I really need it, which is like, you know, now. Um, and so I'm going to, I'm going to get them to fill this out and then I'm gonna start doing physical mail. And in that physical mail, I'm going to start sending out updates of my next uh, meetups and seminars I'm doing you know, collaborations, birthday cards. If, imagine if you're just a casual fan of mine or like a super fan and you get a birthday card from me, you know? And so now I have concentric circles where on the outside of my social media, it's all of my content all the time. On the inside, my daily newsletter where I'm always sending you my thoughts via email. Then you're getting texts from me on a weekly basis, a few times a week. And then you're getting mail from me. It's like on every level I'm touching you. And I don't have to be aggressively offering things when I have that set up. I can just drop it in the field and the interested people will buy it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of beauty in that from the standpoint of, um, well, it, it reminds me of what you said earlier. You said that this is gonna take a year when you were just talking about text messages alone, but yeah. and you're completely fine with that. So I want people to realize that this type of thing is a long-term strategy. But again, once the work is done, the foundation is laid, your competitive advantage compare it to anybody behind you, like there's a there's a ceiling because most people won't be able to just start tomorrow. Even people who have audiences, especially when you add on the fact that current attention is already being um, suppressed on the, like those people who ever already have a following, they're not gonna be able to just send out a message and say, hey, hurry up and follow me now. It's gonna be too late. You're not gonna be able to get that attention out to them that quickly. Absolutely. It's all a game. So. And, and as a matter of fact, I think this is a perfect depiction of what I try to explain to people, but it's hard to conceptualize sometimes that all strategies, like on my channel, when you hear me talk about stuff, then which is the value of the back end conversations and, and, the small, and, the, and the more close parts of the funnel, because all strategies are not something that can be utilized at one time. Right. Absolutely. Like sometimes for one, you can't do everything at once. Right. And Cause if you're doing one strategy, you literally might be diluting the other strategy, but also from the standpoint of, if you hear this strategy, it might not apply to the level that you're on right now. And right. why that up, um, is a perfect example is until you get the numbers right. And go through that process, you're not even able to do the whole mailing card thing in the yeah. effective way. That's what I'm saying. This is, this is Q3, maybe even Q4. And I'm not stressed on when it has to happen. I just have it in mind that this is mm -hmm. the next step, you know? Mm -hmm. And once I have that data, it's forever, you know? And I know that, and I know that it's only going to, and, and, and when you, when you're that deeply into someone's life where they feel like you're really, I mean, you really kind of are in sync with them. Um, you don't have to push hard for the sale. You just mention it and it sells itself. When you're on the outside and you have to do everything via the public platform, like social media, you have to push a lot harder because you got to say, bye, 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 and flood the message, flood it all over the place. You know, listen, 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 you know, engage, engage, engage. But when you're several levels deep and you understand like, okay, there's the top end with social media and there's the email list and there's the text and there's the direct mail, you can target the circles 
that are going to have the greatest impact on the project you're trying to create. And you can do it with much less effort. It's like in martial arts, you know, you understand how to use your energy in the most efficient way rather than always using strength. So I would much rather have a mailing, a physical mailing list of 400 people, you know, that took me a year and a half to build. But when I send a letter out to them, I can sell out, you know, a $10,000 program in two weeks. And with, with no, with no imprint on my other channels, because you're getting this message and you're targeted, you know, all branding on the front end, all branding on the front end. And I actually, I, I found the inside of this card. Let's see if I can show you. I mean, the, the handwriting is so good that they're all like, I, I even get people to say like, I haven't got a handwritten card in years. I'm like, wow, the laser printing is very good on this. Um, I've got college, one of these before. And I yeah, was they're, they're great. trying to figure this shit out because because just being a marketer, I'm like, it's no fucking way that this shit. But I couldn't pr disprove it being not written. That's how good it is. Yeah. Wishing you <laughs> happiness this year and every year. I know you'll accomplish your goals and I'm incredibly lucky to have you in my life. I'm always here for you. I mean, don't, here's the thing. And, and Ryan Leslie was talking about this too. This is a genuine sentiment. I absolutely mean this because I'm sending this out to people that I actually really care about. So mm -hmm. this, what this does is this just automates a touch point for them to get back to me for us to continue the conversation. So this sends it out to them, they get this card and then they text me and say, thank you so much for that card. And I say, you're so welcome. Love you, man. Like, you know, hope you're having a great day. And that's a genuine real conversation. This just made sure that the people that I care about don't fall through the cracks. So, so that's why this stuff is so important. And, um, and that's why I wouldn't, want to try, I wouldn't try to get the mailing address of, of people on the highest end of the funnel. Cause I don't care about people who just are aware of my content. More people who have already bought all the way in, people who have spent you know thousands of dollars with me, people who have who have consumed my content since I've been writing since 2012, those are the ride or dies, and I want them to know how much I appreciate them, and they will at the at the very end of the funnel, <laughs> you know. <laughs> right, right. So, yep. Cool. Yeah, I, I appreciate you pulling that up and and, and seeing that message. I think for it's, it's such an obvious thing. Every time. All right, I, like I already, that's why I told you when we um, we spoke earlier, I, told, I think we were on, on IG, but I said I was going to be looking heavily into it or committing to it more in, in the second quarter. One being the things I got to focus on, the, the sure. you know, the thing that we talked about earlier. But when when I look at artists or, and, and when I look at just anybody who's any kind of public image, and then I hear Ryan Leslie talk about it. It's like every time I hear him talk about it, the shit makes too much sense. It makes too much sense. It makes too much sense. So I get I, I get mad when I, when I hear him talk about it, and I haven't acted enough on it. Right? <laughs> I was getting mad. I was getting mad. That's why I'm like, oh, fuck. Like I, I really got to commit to it because because I, I downloaded Superphone last year. I'm like, this is too much of a learning curve. I got to do. I do this later. Yeah. Uh, but the, but the the thing is, they're turning down the organic reach every day. So every day that I don't convert the audience, I lose the ability to convert them because exactly. Look at my Facebook page. I have 21,000 fans on there and I can't even get a single fucking like, and that will be my Instagram page in two years. Yeah. So you all know? you need, your best bet is going to be doing a reach ad, retargeting everybody. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which, which is genius on their part. Again, I can't be mad, but just understand the game and you know, play it. And I was even thinking like for artists, why not do like, I mean, why not build your text list and do like private intimate concerts with like a hundred people and rent out a venue and charge like 150 bucks for it, but like make it really dope, spend five grand putting together the show and have like food and drinks and a and great setup, great mm -hmm. lighting, film it, keep 10 for yourself, put five into the production use the content that you get from that event to promote more events and you're making 10 grand Easy. a show now and you're new. Easy. Easy. And people, 150 people pay that for nosebleed at Kanye, you know? And, and I mean, I think that's a combination of two things. One, Nipsey Hussle, when he sold his project for mm -hmm. what was it? A hundred dollars or a thousand dollars. One of those. Forget, right. When he sold for that, and he, but he put the attention into the packaging. People slip on packaging. Packaging is, that really dictates how much people pay for stuff, right? Like the pack totally. or ha how much are, they'll pay for it and be happy, right? And I think when you understand that you can 
get 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 more from customers but put that if you put that energy truly into the experience everybody will be happy you're from a branding standpoint you did something doper that you probably wanted to do creatively anyway customers love your brand everything works better that way so a combination of that nipsey idea then ryan leslie doing the concerts in the castle that he was doing yeah um before like that and how long thing. would it take you to start making 10 grand a show as in like the traditional way it would take you a minute you know a minute. like a minute. a minute like a good minute because you have to really prove yourself but if you're just like mm-hmm. what well, do russ say do it myself you know like fuck okay, it i'm gonna do it myself and yeah you don't need that many people to make that happen for yourself and it just takes that consistency and not being afraid or embarrassed to like say hey this is how i'm gonna want to contact you make it happen you could mike jones it in your song you can put it on all your could be the first comment on your youtube link and just make it part of your process like the thing about marketing is it's always a process like even if it looks like magic there's always some sauce in there like there's a process for how we're intentionally creating this content it's intentionally created to create results it's not random and even the even the big artists that look like they just blow up have some intentionality behind it you know, you have that video on Trippy Red where you're like, yeah, he looks like he just came out of nowhere, but like, here's, this is the son of the guy who owns Atlantic and like, there's all this shit going on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and even when you see these big artists, by the way, just so you don't compare yourself to other artists' social media platforms, just so you know, from being behind the scenes of like a lot of influencers and people who have big followings, a lot of people are paying for traffic to their pages, just so you know, okay? They're paying for, and Instagram's constantly changing the algorithm and changing what you can do but tons of artists are paying for followers and engagements and comments. They're doing that because it makes their numbers look better. And mm-hmm. even back in the, in the elections, in the political elections, you know, um, they, we, we found that like, you know, um, when, when Trump was running, like they did a, they did a, um, a survey of like his Twitter followers and they found that like, you know, 45% of them were fake that they were all purchased, you know? And it's just like, these games are, there's smoke and mirrors. And um, you just need to be aware of that. So if you see someone else, you're like, oh, they got, how they get so big so fast? Part of it is artificial inflation and intentional image management. Like we call it the optics, intentional optics management of how this looks. Mm -hmm. Because then if they have 3 million followers, then they can go and they can go to a radio station to get more players. They can go to a record label and say this or that. I know people who, you know, when, when it comes to books, you know, people buy copies of their own book to get on the New York Times list. Like it's, it's a game, it's a game, it's a game. Yeah. I didn't do that. I have, I know people who pay people to write their book and then buy all their own books. So they didn't write the book <laughs> and they didn't sell the book, but now they're New York Times bestselling authors. Yep. And I'm over, here salty. Brain. Yeah. I'm over here salty because I hit number 11. And just so you know, number 11 doesn't get the fucking sticker. You only get sticker if you're one through 10. <laughs> <laughs> you know how Dang. mad I was? You know how hurt Dang. I was about that? But at the same time, I sold, I really did write it and I really did sell it. So mm. it's like, you're not comparing the same thing, you know? You sound like an artist right there, right? <laughs> that, that's the exact same game artist. in the same struggle in that particular space. It's literally, oh, the charts, they're rigged. There are people paying for these. I cre- I actually wrote my song. I didn't have it good. <laughs> that's yeah. the exact struggle you, you, you lived it through and through. When I, when I signed with my publisher, you know, um, cause I'm, cause this first book was with Penguin Random House, which is the equivalent of an Atlantic record. It's a big label, you know, mm-hmm. and when I signed with them, I mean, do we still have time? Can I talk about this? No. Yeah. You're good. Go ahead. Okay. When I signed with them, um, they asked me straight up, they're like, so who do you want to write your book? I'm like, come again. <laughs> like, like they expected me to get someone to hire someone to write the book. Wow. That's crazy. Like, I've written everything up to now. Why would I hire someone else to write this? And I just want to give you. Um, a quick little snippet on like what numbers look like on the publishing side, because the next books that I'm creating this year are going to be all independently published. I have two, possibly three books I'm dropping this year and they're all self-published. And again, you know, uh, Ryan was a huge inspiration for that. And just like chance and following these like independent artists who are like really intelligently, intelligently navigating the system and, you know, I'm grateful for having this book out and it's reached a lot of people, you know, we sold 10 to thousands of copies, but I also haven't seen a single dime since my advance. My advance on this was $150,000, which is good for a first book advance. Uh, 150K plus 15K for Audible. So it was 165K. Okay. Now that advance was split up over 
four payments over two years. Yeah, four payments over two, maybe two and a half years. So it's like, I didn't get it all at once. 15% of that goes to my agent. So I'm walking away with maybe 120 before taxes over two to three years. So that's not really that much money at all. Um, yeah. And the way that it works with book publishing, I'm not sure how it is with records. I'm sure there's similar, you know, it's like, I have to pay back that advance before I make any actual money off of the royalties of the book. And, right. but they don't count a sale for a sale. The book sells, this hardcover sells for, I don't know, like almost 30 bucks hardcover, maybe $25, but th they only count a percentage of that hardcover price as attributed towards my advance. So maybe they only count five to 10% of that as going towards the advance. So I need to sell like wow. 50 to a hundred thousand copies before I see any more money back, probably more than that, before I see any it's money hard. from the actual, it's very hard. And these are books, not even music. Okay. Maybe music yeah. is a little easier. Maybe I don't know. It's books. Okay. People don't even yeah. read anymore. Um, <laughs> but check this out. I sold, um, I sold 30,000 copies uh, of this book. Okay. Jeez. Let's just say for, for shade first, it's a lot. For, for sake of argument, let's just say that that's at a $20 cover price. Now, 150K up front, minus 15% for my agent over two years, or if I'd sold it all myself on Amazon, just self-distributed, that's $600,000. So I missed out on 450 grand by publishing with the big publisher. Yeah, I got in the bookstore. Yeah, I'm in Barnes and Noble. My mom loved that shit. But like mm -hmm. at the end of the day, you know, I'm out 450k. And that's shit, you know, and, and I did all the 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 publisher, Sean, didn't do anything. The reason why they signed with me for that amount was because they knew I already had the numbers to drive the sales. They only wanted me because I could already do the work. You know, they didn't yes. get me on Trevor Noah. I said, get me on Trevor Noah. <laughs> I never got on. You know? Yo, that's see, I mean, that's something that I was thinking about earlier that we got to touch on the fact you, you have the platform to do it, the marketing, but that's a huge aspect that this takes out, right? You don't have to pay as much for marketing. So let alone the fact that you get a bigger cut of whatever you're selling, let alone the fact you get higher open rates and all those things. The fact that your marketing it's not zero, but it gets a far closer to zero than you would get running ads and all the other things that you would do. As a matter of fact, it actually creates more opportunities because now you can get ROI on certain opportunities that you wouldn't even do because you couldn't get ROI. Like I can now just text message, oh, then you, bam, get an ROI on that where in doing a Facebook ad in a lot of cases, but depending on your size and the brand and all that stuff, you wouldn't be able to even fill out that, fill up that venue or the, how much you would have to invest wouldn't be, be able to bring back the ROI that would make it worth doing. So no, I think, I think we're going to get to a point, hopefully, right. Or hopefully not. Right. It just makes it better for uh, people like us where people start to ignore the vanity as much because the vanity always dilutes the economics and the economics. That's a quotable. That that's a quotable. That matters. <laughs> that's a quote. Vanity dilutes economics in most cases. In most cases, yeah. sometimes they're the same. Most times they're not. Yeah. Um, not to mention the fact that at the end of the day, I don't actually own this book. I can't. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I don't own the publishing to this. So technically, it's illegal for me to give out ebook copies of this for free if I wanted to. Really? Technically. Well, yeah. I don't. I don't own it. You know, because yeah. Random House owns yeah. this. The way that they make yeah. money is they buy every single book and hope that three of them a year explode. You know, Where Barack Obama, <laughs> yeah, Barack Obama got a $40 million advance for, for two books. He's taken all my money. I'm not going to get a better advance now because Barack's taken all my money, you know? Yeah. So, which, yeah. now big publishers aren't dead because, you know, Penguin Random House, they own like the majority of the publishing rights to most of the big versions of the, you know, King James version of the Bible. And then like, they own so many. What? Like, yeah, like, they own, like, I never thought about it. It's just weird to think that somebody owns the, yeah, <laughs> the I mean, publishing rights to they the don't Bible. own the Bible, but like they own yeah. all the popular versions of it. So it's like, <laughs> they're printing money forever. Publishing is not dead by any stretch of the imagination, but yeah. it just doesn't make sense for me you know, and I'm working on another book this year and I, I pitched it to my agent and she loved it. And then I was like, 
wait a minute. No, 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 no. Wait, why would I want to do this again? And, 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 and Kirsten, if you ever watch an hour and a half into this interview, which I know you won't, I still love you and maybe we'll work together in the future. But I'm just saying, I can't, you know, I'm not going to lose half a million dollars again on this. I'm sorry. I can't do that. Yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, it doesn't make sense if you're an entrepreneur, right? But, but so would, would Martin Luther King like that? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, he had a dream of me getting paid for my work. Hey, as a matter of fact, his dream, right? The, his second dream, or he started focusing on the money is the thing that people had a problem with. And we want to go that direction. So <laughs> don't ask why I have an action figure. Put it away over here. So I think that it sounds like what you said about publishing is what I've started to see. And, and it is my thesis for pretty much everything when we think about content and and where the value is, which has kind of been that way, what well, has been that way, uh, low key, but people haven't talked about it. And today makes it even uh, more relevant. IP, right, is the game, right? It's yes. not rich 20 something, it's rich 20 something, the ownership of it, and being able to repurpose that because rich 20 something can now easily in today's democratized content era become a web series it could come end up becoming a tv show it could become a a, a, a movie t t yes. uh, shirts everything and not owning that right and that's what the publishing is about and like a, a comic book there's so many different things outside of that primary thing you created it for and you think you're just giving out that but the products as those might seem to be, become commoditized and lose value the ip is ever increasingly more valuable because of these additional ways we can distribute things and flip things, you know, you, I mean, you nailed it. I mean, shit, even, even Disney, uh, if you saw the most recent star Wars, they're still, because they have the rights to the princess Leia character able to put so Carrie much. Fisher in a star Wars three years after she's dead and they're able to reanimate her. Have you seen that new movie? I haven't seen that. Okay. They, they reanimated her. Well, I mean, cause you know, I mean, they basically Tupac, her. you know, they put, they brought Tupac back to, whatever you know hologrammed her That's they wild, hologrammed bro. her it's crazy after she passed, passed and we can still three years. do this legally legally they, they and, and actually what ended up happening was because I, I, I was watching the movie and i was so distracted by the fact that leo was still in it that i almost couldn't focus on the movie and i'm watching the movie i was i was researching this while the movie was playing and i'm like originally they're they're i'm not going to spoil this for you originally they're the whole the script was for princess leia to be like the last jedi and her to be doing the jedi stuff but when she passed, they're like, oh, well, we got to change the script. We can't cut Leia out of it because we need her. She's like part of the story. So they took archived footage from 2015 when she was shooting the first part of the new installment, which was episode six or seven, I believe, seven. They took archive footage from that. They reanimated her with 3D and like, you know how they have like deep fake technology where you can be like, it's deep fake. It's like extremely yeah. good 3D renderings that are indistinguishable from actual people. They rendered her and then they used her dialogue from existing movies to create a script that she could actually say. And then if you see in the movie, she never actually moves. She's always standing in place or she's laying in bed, but they mm -hmm. animated her mouth to move. It's completely believable. There's no, it's completely believable. Yeah. And they own the rights to that character. So even though she's dead, they can legally recast her in a movie sheesh man bro that, and that kind of sucks when you think about it from that that i'm sure her family's getting paid i'm sure her family's getting paid yeah, for it but I'm it's sure just like it's, it's creepy just, yeah yeah you know they, i guess there was no way to write her out i'm sure it was a hard thing. i'm sure it was hard for the i'm sure it was hard to deal with that but i'm just saying yeah it just shows how deep the ownership goes for companies like disney and facebook it, like they, when they own the content and they own the IP, they really own it, even if you die, you know? So be careful who you give that IP to because it's not just about you, now it's about your kids. You know, now it's about the legacy. And mm -hmm. so, you know, it's just something to think about for all creatives. Like, it's not just about creating the work, it's about securing a foundation that will generate fruit. Like, you don't eat the seed today, you plant it. And all of our creative works are planting seeds that will become the fruit. The, the seed isn't the food, it's the fruit, you know? So all the creative work that you're doing should be a seed for new opportunities for you. They should include your marketing hooks. Not, and if you think it's corny, get over yourself. 
They should include your marketing hooks. They should include uh, a clear pathway to get from awareness to purchasing. They should include, um, you know, they should include strong branding and like all that should be intentional. It's not going to happen by accident. If it does, my, one of my philosophies is, you know, if you work hard, you'll get lucky. But if you get lucky, you still got to work hard. You know, even if you do blow up, if you don't figure out how to capture that lightning, you will become a one hit wonder because you don't have those systems in place. So you talked about this in your channel, you know, because I binged your channel. <laughs> Appreciate it, man. Hey, well, look, I, I think that's plenty of valuable content, man. I, I definitely I want to put it out there. I want to have you on again as you progress through this and kind of make you a living case study with the going dark, you know, social and see what those updates look like and give people that idea, hopefully inspire people to get more into it, man. I'm, I'm competitive. You, you make me want to like really make sure I, I, I do this, man. Uh, one of my partners, he's already been doing it more than me lately. So I, 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 we, I, I understand Superphone is, is really the future to me. I, I, I don't think there's, I feel like cell phones, should have already acted that way. I almost still struggle to understand why typical phones haven't started to do that with their address books to more depth. But being able to be somebody who uses this stuff already and hearing the level that you're committed to it, I already know that this is going to be very fun at this, at the say the least. <laughs> you're going to crush it. You're going to crush it. Just start giving out your phone number on all your videos. You know, yeah. Yeah. I texted you with my super phone. You texted me with your super phone. I don't know if we're going to actually talk to each other, but our super phones know each other. So <laughs> I know it's kind of weird, right? Super phone, super phone, you know, yeah. <laughs> no, I think you have, my real, I think you have my, my real number. I mean, it's all, it all goes to the same place. I think, I think that was the first time that I like did that with somebody too. Yeah. It's kind of weird. <laughs> yeah. Well, Hey man, I, I appreciate you again. Hey everybody. This is Daniel D Piazza. Look, you can follow him on Instagram, but we're also going to put his number up, you know, um, somewhere just to get to him for obvious reasons you you see the value from this interview um the, the man offers tons of value a lot of great content he's somewhat worth following not just for like if you're an artist i think you need to be thinking as a business and understand business anyway and i think it's so much easier to learn sometimes from people like that and then come back to some of the general conversations we have so you can connect it in in different ways when you see different applications for it but again follow this guy follow this guy follow this guy i appreciate you again daniel and if, do you want to leave them with anything in particular man you know um just just stop thinking like a consumer you know We've been programmed. I've been saying that so much lately. Are, are, are yeah. we spirit animals or, or did you see my video? <laughs> oh, no, it's the same. It's the same. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Stop thinking like a consumer, you know, yeah. think like a creator and think like a business owner, you know, and understand that your role is different once you make a commitment to, to really take a direction in, you know, to, to really to make a commitment in the direction of your dreams. If you want to make this happen for yourself, whether you're a musician, entrepreneur, you know, once you make that commitment and you decide this is who, what, what I want to do and this is who I want to be, your role changes from one of just passively consuming everyone else's stuff to going on the offense and understanding how this game is played. It's your responsibility to know this. It's no one else's. The tools are out there. You know, people mm -hmm. like Sean are putting these tools out there. It's not a secret. It's not going to happen overnight. And if you can get to the point where you're enjoying the process, it's going to be a lot easier. Um, but Stop thinking like the herd because it's a lot harder to stand out when all you're doing is what everyone else is doing. And if your job is to stand out as an artist, then you have to start changing your perspective. And it starts with watching videos like this, doing stuff like this. You can always hit me up. You know, my thing is Zadvice, uh, plus one, seven, oh, four, three, four, three, six, six, five, nine. That's my cell. You can text me. It will send you a little automated thing. I'll get your info. And then it's actually me texting after that. And um, yeah, I'm here for you. So much love. Dope, dope. Appreciate you once again. As always, everybody, if you like this video, go ahead to the like button. If you like it, you might as well share it. And if you're not subscribed, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button.